Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. So today I'm going to tell you about our new lattice-based protocol. Um, I'll just start quickly by talking about the lattice assumption that we base our protocol on. So our zero knowledge argument is based on a cis problem, uh, the short integer solution problem. Um, in that problem, uh, the input is a random matrix A um, over some finite field ZQ. Uh, it's a wide matrix, and you can solve the cis problem by finding some short uh, some short vector s, which is in the kernel of A. Um, so we're going to make use of the sys problem to create a hash function or commitment scheme uh, where we just apply the public sys matrix to a vector s in order to hash it or commit to it. So if the sys problem is hard to solve, then this gives us a binding commitment scheme or a collision resistant hash. Um, this is going to give us a hiding commitment scheme by the leftover hash lemma if we choose the last part of our message that we're committing to uh, randomly from some distribution with enough entropy. Um, well, the commitment to a hashing operation is just matrix multiplication. So this is a homomorphic commitment scheme. And lastly, something that's important for us for our zero knowledge proof is that this is a compressing commitment scheme. Uh, we can make the matrix as wide as we like, and we can make the message that we're committing to as long as we like, and we'll still get really short, succinct commitments. Okay, so now on to the, the zero knowledge part of the title. Um, in zero knowledge proofs, we have two parties, a prover and a verifier, and the prover would like to convince the verifier that some statement is true um, without revealing any extra information. Um, in particular, the prover might have a secret witness that they don't want the verifier to learn about. So the prover and verifier will interact somehow, and then the verifier is going to accept or reject, depending on whether they were convinced that the statement is true or not. And this has a ton of applications like uh, mixed nets, e-voting, anonymous identification, and verifiable computing. So all zero knowledge proofs should satisfy uh, three basic properties. We've got completeness, so if the statement's true, the verifier should always accept the proof. We've got soundness, so a dishonest prover trying to prove a false statement should never convince the verifier. And if this is only a computational security guarantee, we get the word argument. Um, we get a zero knowledge argument, just like the title. Um, we can strengthen this a bit to knowledge soundness, meaning that the prover actually has to know a witness in order to convince the verifier. Then we get a proof or argument of knowledge. And the last property is zero knowledge. Um, the verifier or anybody else who sees the proof can't learn anything about the prover's witness. They just learned that the statement was true. Okay, so the last part of the title, arithmetic circuits. Um, an arithmetic circuit is a generalization of um, a Boolean circuit that uses gates and computes some statement over a finite field, let's say ZP. And as part of our zero knowledge proofs, we'll be targeting arithmetic circuit satisfiability as the statement. So the statement is going to be an arithmetic circuit and some output values for the circuit, which are finite field values. Uh, the prover's witness is going to be some input values to the circuit, um, some field elements, uh, which give the correct output to the circuit. And this is an attractive target because deciding whether or not this witness exists is an MP-complete problem. So if we come up with zero knowledge proofs for arithmetic circuit satisfiability, then we can target all sorts of interesting statements. And there are other practical reasons why circuits are a good choice, um, namely these, uh, these compilers from other formats into arithmetic circuits. So as part of this work, um, we're largely focused on the communication costs of the protocol. Um, if we're dealing with an arithmetic circuit with n gates, then we want the size of the zero knowledge proof to be sublinear um, compared to the number of gates in the circuit. Um, we care about the cryptographic assumption we're using. Um, we explicitly chose the, the sys assumption, a lattice assumption for our uh, zero knowledge proof because we wanted to have a protocol which was post-quantum secure. Um, lastly, there are lots of other lattice-based zero knowledge proofs that don't target arithmetic circuits but more restricted uh, statements. Uh, we wanted something that could deal with the full generality of arithmetic circuits. Um, but we do also get um, efficient prover computation and verify computation in our protocols. Um, so here's a quick summary of our results. Um, so 
if there's an arithmetic circuit with n gates, then the prover can prove to the verifier that the circuit's satisfiable using roughly um, square root n, um, square root n bits. So that's a square root cost relative to the size of the circuit. And the prover complexity and the verifier complexity are just a quasi-linear size of the circuit. Um, so this beats previous works, which all had linear communication complexity. OK, so how does the argument work? Well, um, there's a typical strategy for this sort of thing, and that's to take the arithmetic circuit, um, turn it into a collection of matrix equations, then some polynomial equations, um, commit to various coefficients of these polynomials, and this gives rise to um, the zero-knowledge protocol in the end. Uh, now, the first part of this process, um, this is not new at all. This is featured in lots of prior works, lots of discrete logarithm-based protocols and different information theoretic proofs. Um, but when we tried to take the existing discrete logarithm-based protocols and just translate them into the lattice settings, uh, we ran into various problems. So we had to add some new stuff in. Um, we had to do some stuff with finite field extensions, and we had to come up with a new lattice-based proof of knowledge. Um, so these bits are, are really the interesting and novel parts of our work. Okay, so first I'll talk about our new proof of knowledge and how it improves on uh, existing lattice-based zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge. Um, so here we have a sys hash function. Um, we've got this public matrix A and a hash T. Those are going to be the, the, the public parts. Those are going to be the statement that the prover proves. The prover is going to demonstrate to the verifier that they know a sys pre-image without leaking any information about the pre-image. Actually, we won't do this for just one sys pre-image at once. We'll do this for um, lots of sys pre-images at the same time. Um, so you can see this is a proof of knowledge for lots of sys pre-images. Or alternatively, the way we'll view it as a component of part of our arithmetic circuit argument later on is um, we'll take roughly a square root n pre-images, and each pre-image will be a vector of length a square root of n. This will prove that the prover knows n small hashed integers are related to the arithmetic circuit. Um, so this is going to be better than previous works because often previous works needed um, O of lambda squared pre-images in order to get um, sort of good asymptotic efficiency for their protocols. They needed to wait some time before amortization benefits kicked in, um, but our protocols are actually efficient as long as you have at least uh, lambda pre-images that you're proving, so just the security parameter. Um, some other advantages that we have. So Typically, lattice-based zero-knowledge uh, proofs of knowledge for pre-images have some gap between the completeness properties and the soundness properties. So first of all, if the prover knows some pre-image S, where all the entries of S are less than some beta, um, the soundness guarantee of the protocol only proves that the prover knew uh, some vector where the entries were less than k times beta. So we call this k the soundness slack. So like other protocols, we do get some soundness slack. Uh, but this is not too much, just polynomial in the security parameter. Some other protocols, um, they actually fail to extract pre-images to the original hash. Instead, you can get something like a pre-image to twice the original hash. Um, we don't have anything like this. We managed to extract exact pre-images um, for, the, for the sys hashes. Um, but if we do allow a multiple like this, then we can get more efficient protocols. Um, so last of all, um, Last of all, previous zero-knowledge proofs in this setting, um, if you wanted to prove pre-images of M hashes, you required O of M size proofs. Um, actually, our zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge scale very differently, um, more like O of lambda, the security parameter. So this can be a lot less. So to show you how our protocol works, I'm going to start by showing you a very simplistic protocol and showing you how it can be transformed into ours by some simple extensions. So the prover is going to choose a random blinding vector y, um, hash that, and send it over to the verifier. The verifier is going to respond with a bit. And then depending on whether the bit was 0 or 1, the prover is going to add their secret sys pre-image onto the, uh, the blinding value y or not, send this value to the verifier. And the verifier is going to um, hash z and check the value of z against um, the hashes it already knew, t and w. Um, so that's a very simplistic uh, zero-knowledge proof of knowledge of a sys uh, pre-image. 
So our protocol, actually, we want to prove that we know lots and lots of pre-images at the same time. So what should the prover do? Well, um, the prover does the obvious thing. Um, instead of just having one uh, challenge C, uh, which determines whether the secret is included in Z or not, we just use lots of challenge bits, which determine whether a particular hash sys pre-image should be included in the sum. Um, I won't talk about uh, completeness and uh, the zero knowledge property um, because they're not the main difficulties in the proof. But you can sort of you can sort of see intuitively that this protocol is going to have knowledge soundness because if the if the prover could send a good response to the verifier which included S1 and had some other values for C2 to CM, some other different bits. Um, if the prover could also send some Z prime which didn't include S1 but had the same values for all the other random challenges, then as part of the security proof, we could subtract one of these values from the other. We could recover S1, and this is basically enough to show that the protocol is uh, knowledge sound if we apply the same idea to all of these different sys pre-images. Um, as part of the security proof, we can guarantee that um, we're going to be able to get responses like this from the prover using some kind of probabilistic averaging argument. Um, but that approach doesn't lead to very good uh, soundness in the end. We get a terrible soundness error. So the simple way around this is just to repeat the protocol um, about a security parameter a number of times. So this means we use random challenge vectors of length about lambda instead of random challenge bits. Um, so if we measure the communication costs of our pro the protocol we get in the end, uh, against the number of pre-images that we're proving on. Actually, the communication costs of the proof scale logarithmically in the number of pre-images rather than linearly, um, which is a big advantage over previous protocols. Um, and when we use this as a, a small component of our arithmetic circuit argument, then we want to, we want to minimize the, the total size of all of the commitments or hashes um, plus the total size of the proof. So when we do this, um, the entire zero-knowledge proof of knowledge it's going to cost about O square root of n uh, when we use it as a component of our circuit protocol. Um, so here's a quick comparison with um, previous works. Um, for us, uh, our commu the communication costs of our proof of knowledge scale linearly in lambda and logarithmically in m, the number of pre-images. Um, so particularly when you have a large number of pre-images, this can be much better than, than previous proofs. Okay, so now I'll move on and talk a little bit about how our arithmetic circuit argument works. Um, so I'll start just by giving a few details on these matrix equations and polynomials and how the circuit's actually encoded as part of the argument. So the high-level structure of the argument takes uh, an arithmetic circuit like the toy example on the right and looks at all the wire values for the arithmetic circuit and splits everything up depending on whether the wire value is a left input a right input or an output of a particular gate. Um, so you can see the, the three columns there corresponding to left, right, and output. And then to verify all the multiplication gates, um, we can check that the entry-wise product of the two matrices at the top is equal to the third one. To check all of the addition gates, we can check that the sum of the two matrices at the bottom is equal to the, the third one. Now, of course, you always have some output wires from some gates feeding into the, the inputs of other gates. So we also need to check that various values across these matrices are equal to one another. Um, so this whole thing gives rise to a way of checking the circuit where we check some multiplication relations for all of the multiplication gates. And for the consistency checks across the matrix and the, uh, the addition checks at the bottom, we have some linear consistency constraints. Um, for a larger circuit, we just do much the same thing with larger matrices and similar consistency checks. And to get the best efficiency of the end, um, in the end, it turns out you want to choose matrices which are roughly a square root n by a square root n. So the approach to giving a zero knowledge proof then for arithmetic circuit satisfiability is the same in lots of previous arguments. Um, the prover commits to some vectors receives a random challenge x from the verifier, and then computes various different linear combinations of the vectors using the challenge x. 
And once the verifier receives those from the prover, the verifier essentially conducts a, um, a polynomial identity test, which has arithmetic circuit satisfiability embedded into the coefficients of the polynomial. So that's a specially designed polynomial. Um, so with that in mind, um, here's a quick overview of what our protocol looks like. Um, in the first step of the protocol, the prover is going to commit to all of the wire values um, from the matrices we saw earlier and send all of the committed values to the verifier. After receiving a random challenge from the verifier, the prover is going to commit to the coefficients of uh, some polynomial used in the verifier's polynomial identity test. Um, then we have, an, have another step where the prover commits to some uh, mod P correction factors. I'll get into that in a moment. And lastly, the prover computes some linear combinations of their, the committed vectors, does some rejection sampling on the result, uh, runs a proof of knowledge for all the commitments in the protocol, and then sends the results to the verifier. OK, so these mod P correction factors, um, what exactly are they used for? Well, um, let's say we're computing a zero knowledge proof. Um, we're working in a ring ZQ, in which, the, uh, in which we have a sys instance, which we're using for hashing and committing. Um, we might be doing arithmetic circuit satisfiability modulo p for a much smaller p. And when you commit to stuff using uh, a sys-based commitment scheme, essentially everything you're committing to is really small. Um, you can treat all the calculations you do on those values as uh, calculations over the integers. So if you're trying to prove something like arithmetic circuit satisfiability mod p, then the prover will need to com commit to some extra mod p correction factors to turn this uh, integer-like computation into a computation mod p to check some kind of condition mod p. OK, so at the end of the protocol, the verifier is going to check some, some size bounds on the information they receive and check that all the linear combinations they received from the prover were correctly made up in terms of um, all of the prover's committed values. So in terms of the efficiency of the protocol and where the hard work is, um, the prover commits to um, about a square root n vectors containing a square root n y values as part of the first step of the protocol, then about the same number of uh, polynomial coefficients in the second step. Um, there are just a constant number of vectors um, which make up these mod p correction factors. Then finally, the prover is going to send like a, a constant number of uh, vectors to the verifier, these linear combinations of commitment openings. So this diagram just gives some intuition about how we choose parameters to make sure our protocol is secure. So at the bottom, we have P. We might be trying to verify an arithmetic circuit modulo P. Um, since the values P are much smaller than the binding space of the commitment scheme, uh, once the prover does some calculations on these values, the maximum size of the values that the prover needs to commit to as part of the protocol are a bit bigger. And then due to this uh, soundness slack appearing in an earlier slide, the maximum size of the openings that you can guarantee through uh, knowledge soundness are a bit bigger than that. In order for our protocol to be secure, we need the binding space for the sys commitment scheme to be a little larger still, and so the modulus Q for the, the sys instance has to be even bigger than that. But luckily, there's just a polynomial size gap between these two, so some back of the envelope calculations revealed that maybe Q had to be about p to the power 5 or p to the power 6, something like that. Okay. Um, there are some additional issues to take care of, too. So this kind of protocol in the discrete logarithm setting uses polynomial identity testing, too. And then since the prime that you're using in the discrete logarithm setting is, is very large, the probability that something will go wrong with the polynomial identity test is very small. But when we work in a sys-based setting, the primes involved are much smaller, so this isn't the case. To get around this, we adapt some finite field extension techniques from previous work. And we also have some clever ways of embedding um, base field operations into um, operations on field extension elements. Uh, this is basically a trick to get um, much better soundness as part of the polynomial identity test. So this protocol achieves a square root communication complexity in the end um, in the number of gates in the arithmetic circuit. But it's a translation of discrete logarithm-based protocols. And the best discrete logarithm-based protocol achieves a logarithmic communication cost. So 
this is a good result, I think, but we still have some work to do. Thanks very much. Thank you.